let's take a dive into some of the gene editing tools and um, and whatnot a little bit. Over the last 10 years since Jennifer Doudna and colleagues first developed uh, CRISPR gene editing, there's been a lot of excitement about it. Uh, your lab was one of the first to show that gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9 could be done in normal human cells. But acknowledging the undoubtedly like revolutionary impact of, of CRISPR, do you think it's possible it's been overhyped from the standpoint of the public at large not having a more comprehensive or appropriate understanding of where it sort of fits within the existing tool sets of synthetic biology? Yeah, I think uh, I, I hesitate to use the word hype because it implies that somebody is being hyperbolic. Uh, I think it was it was kind of a t- team effort of, of of just it's wonderful that we're bringing it any part of uh, reading and writing genomes and and synthetic biology to people's attention or or science for that matter. This is one of the more exciting things in science right now. It's getting people, but it's not. It's not just about CRISPR. Uh, I mean, first of all, you can't really edit if you can't read. So I think the big revolution here is being able to read the genomes. You read them at the beginning to, to find the tools. You read them again to decide what your goals of, of editing are. Then you, uh, and then you read it a few times to make sure your, your editing is going well. And then you, then you read it again to, to see that the edit that you made has the physiological consequences, which increasingly it, we're using DNA reading as a way of, uh, or RNA reading to see how the physiology is going. Uh, the so-called epigenomics for physiology. So uh, that reading is important. Another thing that's important is there was some pretty good editing methods that, w- that are still in use that predate CRISPR, uh, notably uh, homologous recombination, which S- Smithies and Capecci got the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, decades before uh, Jennifer and Emmanuel. Um, I'm a big fan of Jennifer and Emmanuel, by the way. We've started a few, a few companies together, uh, Jennifer and I. Um, th- but uh, there's homologous recombination, which is very powerful. It, it's precise and over large distances, while CRISPR tends to be imprecise and, over, and or small in scope. Um, Another one that dates back two decades before CRISPR is uh, SSAPs or Lambda Red, it's sometimes called. It's a way of getting precise editing. And, th- and that's what we actually used to um, uh, around 2009 to make libraries of billions of edited cells uh, in a day, a single person. Um, so that, that shows some of the power. And the other evidence of its power was that that was the first completely recoded genome was done mostly a combination of uh, SSAPs and um, recombinases, which is also very, very precise. Um, CRISPR was basically a, a hatchet, and I sometimes call it genome vandalism. So I, I, I think we need to embrace all of these methods, though, and a few more that are, that are coming uh, now. Uh, deaminases that can be done with and without CRISPR um, and more sophisticated SSCPs and, and uh, integrases, transposonases. So it's a rich, uh, I think it's okay if the public just lat- latches on to one aspect of it, um, but it would be nice, it, it is nice whenever uh, a more nuanced and, and visionary form uh, where it illustrates the importance of reading and uh, other more precise uh, and larger scale editing and writing uh, where you write, synthesize something from scratch and usually pop it in by some, um, could be popped in by CRISPR, but more commonly it's popped in using recombinases or integrases. What about some of the um, existing capabilities of, you know, gene editing therapy, you know, things that have been done, you know, in you know, transgenic models for, you know, a, a decade at least or more, um, you know, so deleting versus addition versus, you know, of a mission, yeah. missing gene. Right. So, uh, yeah, so you can think of uh, CRISPR as a subset of editing. Editing is a subset of genome engineering uh, and genome engineering can, is not a subset of, but it's a kind of a Venn diagram overlapping set with therapies. 
and uh, GMOs and so forth. So uh, most gene therapies that have been approved uh, are adding genes. And this is done typically without CRISPR. And, and um, uh, you know, when you have a genetic disease, you're missing a gene, so you don't really want to edit necessarily. You want to um, add it back in. As you, as you grow older, uh, a lot of your gene products, your gene expression is dropping down. One way to deal with that would boost it back up. And we've, we've explored um, these sorts of things. Um, the, the use of uh, gene therapy, putting in a, a missing gene, uh, and in fact, editing for that matter, uh, for, for rare genetic diseases is by its nature expensive. Uh, it, it's millions of dollars per person over a lifetime. Um, partly because the R and D costs and the palliative care and, and all sorts of health care for someone who has a very severe disease that, that might've died young, um, years ago, but thanks to the orphan drug act and others. Uh, they, they can now uh, lead um, closer to normal life, but, but at millions of dollars. Uh, there is, um, it's great to have, uh, we'll keep developing these gene therapies and better ways of delivery. Oh, I forgot to mention delivery is another thing that's sometimes missed when people just shout CRISPR. Uh, you have to get it to the right place, the right dose, the right time, um, maybe to turn off when it's done its job. So keep it off target, keep it off target. So minimum. So anyway, the, the, this the, uh, delivery, an alternative to this expensive solution is a much more, a much lower cost one, which is genetic counseling, where you basically uh, tell people before they get married, before they, uh, before preconception, um, or sometimes post-conception that they, um, that they're at risk. Um, they themselves are carriers. They will be, they are healthy. They will be healthy. But if, if they, um, marry someone that has the same carrier status, um, they, they put their children at risk. So, so there's, the, the, there are two methods. I think a lot of the Western world tends to go towards the interventionist, you know, reactive medicine where we'll spend millions of dollars, in, you know, by not pursuing preventative medicine, but the preventative medicine in this case is, you know, low hundreds of dollars, um, just to, to, to know yourself, to know, um, uh, how to, how to keep your children healthy by, uh, making preconception choices. We'll probably circle back to a little bit more of that in a minute, but since we're, we're talking about, uh, you mentioned a few other types of, you know, gene editing, the deaminase, and you've talked about this multiplex editing, what does it mean to be able to go, you know, to performing 26,000 edits or you said, I mean, a million, potentially a million edits in human cells, you know, versus the previous record of something like 62? I mean, what applications does this most impact? Is it, you know, the large genome creation or tissue engineering or germline? Right. So we, we did our, our, our previous record of 62 or... 42, depending on how you count it, uh, was in pigs. And it was for tissue engineering. It was germline. Uh, so germline is kind of off the table for human, in part because there, there's no clearly articulated medical need. Uh, and the, the time for discovering safety and efficacy is over a lifetime, which is, you know, unaffordable and ill-advised. So anyway, but germline certainly work gets into humans via, um, uh, pigs. Uh, so, so that th this has been the idea of transplanting organs from animals to humans goes back at least to the 1960s where, uh, a, a chimpanzee kidney survived for nine months in a, in a, in a school teacher, uh, who went back to teach and, you know, was normal for nine months. Um, but that was, that was the exception then. And it would, and it, would, it would be the exception now, except for the synthetic biology that we do on the germ line of pigs, which now are made it into uh, many uh, preclinical 
uh, primate tri primate uh, transplant trials, pig to tri primate, and a few uh, pig to human trials that are going on. Primate survival looks like around 600 days so far, and there's still uh, a couple of them are still alive uh, at 500 or 600 days. Um, but we're going to we're keep improving these, um, but that's that's in the order of 40 to 60 uh, edits per genome in the germline. Uh, if the, the multivirus resistance requires more than that, uh, the um, uh, some things that are done for uh, diversity and ecosystem um, ma maintenance may involve even more. Uh, there are uh, a type of tape recorder, sometimes called a flight recorder, so it's analogous to planes that that record a lot of data, but typically you don't read it. So a lot of writing, not much reading, unless the plane goes down and then, then you'll look at, you'll look at selective regions for debugging what went wrong. That same thing could be put into the uh, bodies of plants, animals, and, and even humans, um, to, because it's a very compact recording device of the physiological states of every cell in the body. And we've, and we've, we've shown this works sort of in the scale of 60 to 24,000, and that's that's probably our neck our our first effort at, at making a million edits will be in these in the form of these molecular flight recorders. So those are a few examples, but the number will grow as soon as as soon as we get more than a handful of people working on on these uh, visionary projects. Um, um, what we'll see. Uh, a blossoming of all sorts of creative uses of, of making uh, multiplex editing. I think non-multiplex editing will become the exception. I love CRISPR. I, uh, I personally benefited from it, but it, it is, uh, um, I like to balance it. There are other nucleases that some people claim are more specific, less off target. Uh, there are deaminases that don't involve CRISPR. Um, so I wouldn't say you, I would, you, you, term unique is too strong. Uh, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox, and uh, um, in, you know, and, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with um, delivery and testing too. Testing is a big deal, which is somewhat swept under the rug uh, when we're just it's just like all we have to do is design a you know a CRISPR and take care of everything. But there's a lot of reading and. Uh, right, you know, synthesis, which isn't CRISPR, and and then the, the, the delivery and testing. So it's it's a integrated whole that doesn't require CRISPR. So another technology would be base editing, which uh, you know doesn't involve double stranded breaks and DNA. Right. And I know there's a, a phase one B trial with the PCSK9 target. They're targeting yes. it, gene targeting it for the liver as a, a potential right. treatment for the hypercholesterolemia, a familial yes. form. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I just read about this recently and pretty excited. I mean, I've, you know, I know people that are, that are taking the anti PCSK9 antibodies, which are, are very expensive. Um, and, uh, you have to get them every two to four weeks. So, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if the base editing could be a one and done treatment, do you think, or, uh, that, that is one of the advantages of gene therapy in general, whether it's editing or, or adding genes. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think that a lot, of, a lot of our diseases are diseases of, of wealth. I mean, we used to have much more active uh, vegan diets, um, low, you know, low in overall carbohydrates, mainly because it was just low in calories altogether. Um, and so diabetes and, uh, cardi and some of the cardiovascular diseases didn't affect us. Also, we didn't live as long in general, uh, so it was less of an issue. So these are, but, but, but PCSK9 is a, it looks like it's shaping up to be a terrific uh, example um, of something that basically all humans can be thought of as having the same disease. And therefore, it's a large market, could be low cost. Aging is another, or a variety of age-related diseases that might have a common core, 
where we are programmed to die at a certain age. The mice die at two years old, bowhead whales at 200, humans somewhere in between. And so that's probably negotiable. Um, uh, PCS can, is, is not solving aging in general. It's, it's a very specific um, thing that may be common to most hu humans. It was de-risk because there were a few humans that were walking around that were basically double null for both copies of their PCS can I for mom and dad. And that, that kind of showed us that it was going to be safe and effective. Um, although there's still quite a bit of study, long-term studies that have to be shown to make sure it doesn't cause early um, onset neurodegeneration in the particular way that we're uh, implementing it, which is not germline, which is how it, the uh, people that previously had PCSK nulls, not nulls for germline via natural mutations.